Now, um, if you have a bookmarker or something, you could, you could set it in, in John 17. We're going to be coming back to this. We're coming back to it a little bit later in the sermon. But right now, go ahead and flip back just a few pages to John chapter number 8. John chapter number 8, verse number 23. We read this this morning, John chapter 8, so I don't want to reread the whole chapter again. John 8, verse 23 says, And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. And what I'm going to preach about today is, is that phrase that Jesus Christ said. He said, I am not of this world. Okay? And... Basically, I'm going to be explaining to you, because this concept of the world comes up quite a bit in the Bible, and we're going to go through a lot of passages that talk about, you know, um, the love of God and the love of the world, and we're going to, I'm going to try to help define what he's even talking about, like, of this world, things that are of this world, and um, we're going to look at a bunch of scripture here, because just about everything that we see, or everything that we hear, and things that go on in this world, like, they all have a source, and I think they could be narrowed down to basically one of two things. The source of all information or the source of all, I guess, things that have influence or, or things that you can receive. That, you know, Information is a pretty good word because that kind of spans a lot of things. Information is just, I mean, just in general, information. Um, it, all, it all ultimately has a source. And, and what I'm trying to narrow it down to is just basically the source can either come from God or it could come from this world. Now... And that includes, you know, the prince of this world. So, so the Bible talks about the devil being the prince of this world. You know, so we're going to be looking at things that are, that are, is the source coming from God or is the source of this world? Now, first of all, everybody starts off in the world. You know, when we're born, we're born into this world. Go ahead and turn to 1 John chapter number 5. 1 John near the end of the Bible. 1 John chapter number 5. We all start off in the world, so to speak. And uh, just by being born physically into this world, we're born into the world. And everybody, in order to be saved, needs to overcome the world. Okay? And we're going to see in 1 John chapter 5 how we can do that. 1 John 5 verse 4, the Bible says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? So if you're saved today, you've already overcome the world. The Bible says in order to overcome the world, you need to put your faith in Jesus Christ. So we all start off in this world. We need to overcome the world, though. The world is contrary to God. The things of this world are, are not in, in a, accordance or in alignment with God and, and, and um, what he has for us. We need to overcome that. So first and foremost... You know, you need to be saved, and, you need, and when you get saved, the Bible says you overcome the world, because if you, put, you, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you've overcome the world. That's what 1 John 5, 5 says. Now, we always need to be judging, and turn back to just chapter number 4 in 1 John, because we always need to judge what we hear from people, especially when people are trying to teach you something about God, if someone's trying to do something religious, if someone's trying to expound scripture or trying to explain something biblical to you, you need to be a good judge of what they're saying and where is the source. So in 1 John chapter 4, it says in verse 1, we're going to read about six verses here. It says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. So he's saying first, try means basically you're proving it, you're testing it, you're judging it. If you're going to try the spirits, you need to know whether someone is bringing you information or, bring, or telling you truth that's from God, or if they're a false prophet telling you lies and telling you things that basically are of the world, that are of the devil, that are things that are not from God. We need to constantly be judging these things and testing these things, and even the things that I say. I want everyone that comes to this church and everyone that's under the sound of my voice to be able to judge the things that I'm saying against the Bible to see if they are true, to see if they're coming from God, if, if this is... If this information, if the words I'm speaking are coming from the Bible, then it's, then it's of God. But if it's just my own opinions, my voice, then that's not, a, that's not of God. You know, and um, you need to be able to judge that. Verse 2 says, Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. So this is how we can know what is the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh 
is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. So he's given a very good, a pretty good litmus, litmus test here of things that are of God, things that are of the world. And especially the people at these times, I mean, the Jews at that time that didn't believe in Christ, they were still believing in a Messiah to come. They were believing, they didn't believe that, that Christ was coming in the flesh. And that's one of the big reasons why I think he's saying here, look, anyone that's telling you that Christ hasn't come, that Jesus Christ has not come in the flesh, he said, that's not of God. Watch out for them. And there were a lot of false prophets in those days testifying that, no, 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 Jesus was not the Christ. He was, the Messiah was not come in the flesh. And they're saying, look, that's Antichrist. If people are telling you that, that's Antichrist. Verse number four, ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world. Therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God, he that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So here again we see another reference to, to the world as being a source of information or a place of information and the people that are in the world versus the things that come from God. So he's saying they are of the world. These false prophets, they're of the world. There's, and when it says of the world, it's like from. You know, they're from the world. They're of the world. They speak of the world. So, you know, because they're of the world, that those are the things they speak. If you're of God, then you should be speaking the things that are of God. And it says the world heareth them. So, you know, all these false prophets and these false teachers that are out today, the world's going to hear them and they're going to understand what they're saying. And, you know, they might not always agree with it, but they're going to hear them. They're going to understand it. When they hear the Bible, when they hear things that are of God, that are truly of God, they're not going to be able to understand this because it says, he that is not of God heareth not us. People who are not of God are not going to be able to hear and understand. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 2 because this is explained in the Bible as well. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. The unsaved world cannot even understand the Bible because it is spiritually discerned. We need to have God's spirit in order to, to, to understand what the Bible is talking about. This is a spiritual book. We need to understand this. This book is not of the world. The source of, this, of, the, of the, the words written in this book is not from the world. Any book that you read, think about it, any book that you read, if you read a novel, if you read a story, you read an autobiography, anything you read, you can understand that. I mean, even if it's written in, in somewhat hard to understand language, like Shakespeare or something, I mean, which I don't believe is very hard. It's the same language that the Bible's written in. But, you know, some, some of the language is a little bit more, um, you know, artistic or, or um, poetic. But you could still understand it. I mean, you can understand what they're saying. They're telling you a story and you get it and you comprehend it. Any of those stories are easy to be understood. The Bible is not nearly as easy to be understood. And, and by far, if you ask people, you know, like, name a book that you've read that you don't really understand what it's talking about, I think everyone's going to say, like, the Bible. I always read the Bible, especially those that are not saved. They all say, you know what, I try reading the Bible, I don't even understand it. And it's because they're not saved, but you need the spirit of truth. You've you got to understand it's coming from God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, look at verse number 11. It says, for what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him. So he's saying, look, the things of man, we understand by the spirit of man that's in us. We, you know, we're all born you know, there's a spirit of man that you have that you can understand the things of man. It says, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. So the things that are of God, the only thing that, that can understand that is the spirit of God, is what he's saying. Verse 12, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. So we say, look, we haven't received the spirit of this world, we have received the Spirit from God. That's why we're even able to know about these things. We might know the things that are freely given to us. God's given us this wisdom. God's given us freely all this information, all this knowledge from God. But we need the Spirit of God in order to understand these things. And he's saying they already have received that Spirit. Look at verse 13. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God.
for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So the Bible is saying here, the natural man, the man that is of this world, naturally when you're born into this world, when you don't have the spirit residing in you, you don't have the spirit of God, the natural man, he can't receive. He said this foolishness unto them. When we preach the Bible, especially the sermon I'm, be, I'm preaching tonight, the world's going to hear this and they're going to say, that man's a fool. That man's off his rocker. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Oh, yeah, he believes some book written by man. You know, what a fool. He's deceived. It's foolishness to the world. And that's what they're going to think about it. And then it says, neither can they know. They can't even understand because the truths that are in the Bible, they're spiritually discerned. In order to understand this, you have to have God's spirit. And you have to get that spirit by faith. You have to not be able to see. It can't be proven to you. There's no way that it can ever be laid out in a way that's just total proof. You have to take it on faith. And when you take God's word on faith, then you can understand them. It's real interesting the way God did that. I mean, I don't know exactly why God did it that way, but I think it's pretty cool that, look, you're not going to be able to understand these things. First, you have to believe it. But after you believe it, it's amazing how you understand it. You make the decision to put your faith in God's word, and then afterwards, he opens up that understanding. He lets you see clearly. I remember trying to read the Bible before I was saved. I, I couldn't understand a word of it. I'd be, I'd be looking at this stuff and like, what in the world is this talking about? I think I understand what's going on in this book. And then it's like, what? And like, just really confusing. I didn't get it at all. After I, after I got saved, after I put my faith in Christ, you know, it's not like you just understand everything in the Bible, you understand every single word immediately. But I'll tell you what, the veil's removed from your eyes. You can, you can understand a lot more. You start reading it, and yeah, it takes a while to get everything and to, and to really let it sink in and learn. But it, it is night and day, the difference that you have after you're saved when you actually read this book. It's no longer completely confusing. Uh, you know, of course there's going to be some parts, man, I don't really understand this, I don't really understand that, but the Bible as a whole, you read the Bible from cover to cover, you're going to understand a lot of it. Way more than you ever did as a natural man. Because, I mean, the Bible even says they can't receive it. Turn over to chapter number 3, 1 Corinthians. You're in chapter 2, just one more page over, chapter number 3. Look at verse number 18. It says, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. So the Bible is saying, look, you know, the wisdom of this world, the people who seem seemingly are very smart in this world, very educated, you know, those philosophers and the people that have all these degrees, and they are really smart in this world. The Bible says the wisdom of this world is foolishness unto God. And the Bible says not just that. It says, if any man among you seem it to be wise in this world, it says, look, if you're a wise person according to this world, you have all this worldly wisdom, it says, let him become a fool first. You need to become a fool in order to, be, in order to really be wise. Because in order to really be wise, you need to have the Spirit of God. Because God's Word is truth. And the more of God's Word and truth you have in yourself, then that's where the real wisdom comes from. Because that's the truth. I mean, people, the, the, the wisdom of this world... Most of it is lies anyways. I mean, you think about like the evolution and, and all this other garbage, this junk science that they spit out. Anyone who, who really gets into that, they'll say, oh yeah, that person's really smart. They really know what they're talking about. Man, they're intelligent. It's foolishness. It's foolishness unto God. Unless it's coming from God, it's foolishness. Now, I was having a hard time when I was, when I was preparing this sermon because I wanted to try to explain this concept of what does the Bible mean by the world, right? And I think that a lot of the verses we've already read, I'm hoping it's helped kind of get you a little bit of understanding what we're talking about versus on what the things of the world are versus the things of God. We're going to go back to John 17 now. We're gonna, that's the, the chapter we started off with. John chapter 17. Now John 17, in the very first verse, it's, it's basically, this is a prayer from Jesus Christ unto God. And the first verse says, These words spake Jesus, and lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father. So he starts off, this is a prayer to God from Jesus Christ while he's on this earth. Just keep that in mind as we're going through this. Jump down to verse number 6. It says, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. 
So here we're seeing, okay, the men that God gave this me says out of the world. God gave them out of the world. They were in the world. God gave them these men out of the world. Look at verse number nine. He says, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Jesus Christ is not praying for the entire world. Now, it's God's will, God's desire that the world would be saved. God wants the world to be saved. But Jesus Christ is specifically praying for his children. Jesus Christ is specifically praying for his disciples. Jesus Christ is not just praying for the goodness in general of the whole world. Because the world is of, is of the world. The world is of the devil. In, we're at the point it's at now, you know, um, after sin and after uh, everything, you know, God's perfect world was corrupted by sin. He says, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. Look at verse number 11. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. So Jesus said, look, I'm leaving this world. While I've been here, I've watched over them. I've kept them safe. I've looked out for them. I've prayed for them, but I'm not going to be in this world anymore. But they are. He said, when I leave, they're still going to be here. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. So he's praying, guys, that God, look over them. I'm not going to be here anymore. I need to go. I need some more business to accomplish. I'm not going to be on this earth anymore. God, keep them and watch over them. Now jump down to verse 14, because this is real important. The Bible says, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them. Because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So the Bible explains right here, look, if you're living according to God's word, even if you're, um, you know, if you're saved, if you have God's truth in you, the Bible says the world has hated them. The world's going to hate you because you're not of the world. You don't come from the world. The world's not going to be able to understand you. The world's not going to get you. The world as a whole in general is going to hate you. Because you're not of the world. You're from the Father. You're of God. And the things that are of the world are contrary to God. That's why they're going to hate you. If you're, and especially the more that you live according to God's word, the more that you speak out and speak truth and speak what God has for you and speak what the words of this book, the more the world is going to hate you. Because the world doesn't understand that and it's contrary to the world. Look at, um, we're in John 17. Flip back to John 15. Jesus Christ explains this a little bit. Verse 18, John 15, 18. Jesus Christ explains this a little bit more here. He says, If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. So he's trying to explain them. Look, if you're hated, if you start feeling the attacks, if you're getting hated of this world and people don't understand you, and you're hated by the world, he said, Look, it hated me first. When Jesus Christ came into the world, the world hated, the world hated Jesus Christ. They mocked him. They stripped him down, they whipped him, they beat him up, and spit in his face and nailed him to a cross. The world hated Jesus Christ. Because he wasn't of the world. He exposed the wickedness of the world, and the world hates that. The world hates when people go and shine a light on the darkness that's in this world. They hate that, and they're going to attack. They hated Jesus Christ, but you know what? If, if anything, we can have a little bit of comfort knowing that, look, if you're being hated by the world, it hated Jesus, they hated Jesus Christ first. Anything that you're going through, Jesus Christ already went through it. Look at verse number 19, John 15, 19. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. So he explains, look, if you were of the world, the world's going to love you. If you're, if you're espousing the things of the world, if you're of the world, the world's got no problem with you. The world loves you. But if you're not of the world, the world's going to hate you. It's as simple as that. And he explains, that's why the world hateth you. He says, I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Verse 20, remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. So he's telling people, look, he's telling them there's two types of people. If there's, if there's the people that have persecuted Jesus, anyone that's persecuted Jesus Christ, hey, they're going to persecute you too. 
The servant is not greater than his Lord. Look at, uh, turn to Luke chapter 6. The servant is not greater than his Lord. We're not better than Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ was attacked, if Jesus Christ was hated, if Jesus Christ was ridiculed in this world, don't think that you're going to get a pass from that. You're not better than Jesus Christ. He's saying they will also persecute you. But then he also added, if they have kept my saying, they're going to keep yours also. So anyone who keeps Jesus Christ saying, look, when you're of God and you're bringing God's word, hey, the people that are of God, they're going to hear that. They're going to love that. And you know what? That's, that's what, um, you know, hopefully this church can attract people who are believers in God's word and that love the truth because they're going to want to congregate here and, and say, hey, let's, let's hear some more of the truth. Let's understand. Let's learn more. I love that. That sounds good to me. I mean, the, the, the truth is something that we all, everyone that's here today, I know, is really interested in understanding and knowing the truth. We are of God, but the world is not of God. The world's going to persecute you. Look at Luke 6, verse 26, because this is an important warning and, and, and something that we could use to try the spirits and understand. Luke 6, 26 says, Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. So in both of these verses, John 15 and, John, and Luke 6, they're both telling us that, look, if they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If you're not being persecuted by the world at some point, I mean, I'm not saying every single day of your life you're just going to be going through constant nonstop persecution, but I'll tell you what, if you're living for God and if you're doing what's right, you will suffer persecution. They will persecute you. And, and Jesus even said in Luke 6, said, Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. If the whole world is accepting of you, if I were to post my sermons online and the whole world's just like, oh man, Pastor Burzens is great. Listen to this. And you have the Pentecostals and the Catholics and just the Mormons. Everybody's just saying, look, man, Pastor Burzens, listen to how great of a message he has. And the whole world just loves you. And they're asking me to bring the Bible before Barack Obama so he can put his hand on it and... and and become the president of the United States. Look, if you're loved of the world like that, woe unto you, the Bible says. Jesus Christ said, woe unto you. If the you know the world's if you're of God, the world's gonna hate you. This is a very good indication to figure out which prophets are not of God. <clears throat> Billy Graham, <clears throat> Joel Osteen, any of these, Rick Warren, any of these guys, these men are loved by the world. The world loves these men. They're not going through persecution. They're not suffering for Christ's sake. The world loves them because they're of the world. They're saying the things that are of the world. Jesus Christ said, woe unto you. If all men are speaking good of you, now it doesn't mean no men are going to speak well of you. Obviously, those that are of God are going to hear your words. Those that are of God are going to listen. They're going to believe. But by and large, that's not as many people, not nearly as many people as those that are of the world. Those in our world are going to hate you, and they're going to persecute you. Now, we still have some hope. You don't have to turn to John 16, 33. Jesus Christ also said this. He said, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. He's warning. He said, look, you're going to have tribulation. The world hates you. The, world is, the devil's going to persecute you. The world's going to persecute you. You're going to go through troubles. You're going to go through trials. You're going to go through tribulations. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus Christ has already overcome this world. Jesus Christ has the victory over this world. And we have the victory through Jesus Christ. Now in John chapter 17, uh, you don't have to turn there. If you would, just go ahead and turn to... Um, well, yeah, go ahead and turn to John chapter 17. That's fine. Turn to John chapter 17, back where we were. We're going to finish off here a little bit in John 17. And we're going to move on. Because this is still his prayer to God. Now, Jesus' prayer for us that are not of this world is that we should be sanctified. Look at verse 16. It says, They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. God wants us to be sanctified. Okay? Um, those of us that are not of this world. Now, sanctified means set apart. 
When you're sanctified, you're, you're, you're set apart, you're removed. He doesn't want us to be a part of this world. We are not of this world. We should have nothing to do with this world as far as the way we live our life and the things that we do. Now, yes, we are in this world. We have to live in this world. We live our day-to-day -day life in this world. But we are not of this world, and we should be set apart from this world. There should be something different about us that someone can look at you and say, they're not, they're not quite like everybody else. They're not like everybody else that is in this world. Because you're not of the world. You ought to be standing out. You shouldn't just look and dress and act and everything that comes out of your mouth is just like everybody else that's in this world. Jesus' prayer for about us and for us is that we would be sanctified. And how do we get sanctified? To sanctify them through thy truth. It's God's truth. And what is God's truth? Thy word is truth. God's word will sanctify us. We need to get in God's word. We need to study God's word. We need to understand God's word and apply it to our lives because it's the truth. And the more we learn God's word, the more we learn the truth is how we're going to get sanctified because we make those changes in our life and say, oh, look, God says this is wrong. Well, everyone else is doing it. Well, you're going to be sanctified. You're going to be set apart when you stop doing that. When you say, look, this is the truth. This is God's word. I'm not going to do that anymore. The Bible says we're supposed to be a peculiar people. Peculiar means different. We're strange. We're not like the world. Hebrews 11, 13, you have to turn there. The Bible gives that whole list of people of great faith. The great men of the Bible that had a lot of faith. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Samuel and the judges and all these people did all these great things for God. It says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth because they weren't of this earth. We know that we have a home in heaven. Our home isn't on this earth. We're sons of God. We have an inheritance. We're just spending our time here. We're pilgrims. We're strangers. We don't belong on this earth. We belong to God. We're just passing through. This earth is not our home. And we ought to treat that, our, our existence here, as such. Because we're not of this earth. We're not of this world. We're of God. And we ought to live like we're of God. Now, in John, you were in John 17. Let's turn back to John 16, one chapter over. Look at verse number 7. Because God's given us the comforter. God has given us the comforter so we can even know what, what is of God. And he's given us his comforter to help us. And it, the comforter also, it says here in verse, um, verse 7, we're going to start reading that the, that the Holy Ghost reproves the world of sin. Look at verse number 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Verse number 8. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, and of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the Prince of this world is judged. Now I'm going to share something with you. The Holy Ghost here, it says, is going to be doing the reproving the world of sin. Now, the Holy Ghost does not use its own audible voice. The Holy Ghost is the comforter. The comforter has given to us, after Jesus Christ was glorified, he gave, us, he gave man the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, which dwells inside the believers. So first of all, not everybody has the Holy Ghost. It's only dwelling inside of believers. And in order for the Holy Ghost to reprove the world of sin, guess what? The Holy Ghost is going to be speaking through man's mouth to do that. This is not just some feeling from some unsaved person that they're going to be reproved of sin because the unsaved person doesn't even have the Holy Ghost in them. The comforter, the Holy Ghost is going to reprove the world of sin. And when he has come, it says in verse number 8, He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness of judgment. It is our job, it is the job of the believer, it is one of the jobs, and it's the job of the Holy Ghost within, within the, the believer to reprove the world of sin. 
The world is full of sin. Sin is of the world. And that's what I'm doing here tonight. I'm trying to, to show you, and I'm, I'm trying to, hopefully the Holy Ghost through me will be reproving the world of sin. And the Holy Ghost is doing that through God's word. God's word, God's already judged. He has his judgments here on the sins of this world. And the Holy Ghost is used through the preacher that preaches God's word of that sin. It says, of sin because they believe not in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father, you see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Now we're going to see, turn to 1 John chapter number 2. 1 John chapter number 2. We're almost done. We've got a little, bit, a little bit more to go. 1 John chapter number 2. We're going to see some very, very, very strong words about loving this world. As a believer, you should not love the world. 1 John chapter number 2. We need to be reproving the world of the sin. We need to be different. We need to stand apart. And the more you do that, the more you're going to be hated of the world because you're not of the world. 1 John chapter number 2, look at verse number 15. The Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in it. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So here I'm trying to get, again, there's this definition of what is of the world and what is of the Father. Right? The Bible says everything that's in the world, all that's in the world is not of the Father, because it's of the world. And it says, And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So, I'm going to get very specific here about what what are some things that are of the world? We're not supposed to love... The Bible says if you, if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. The Bible says you don't love the Father if you're loving this world. If you love the things of this world, if you love what's going on out in this world, if you love the, 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 what the world promotes, if you have a love for that, the love of the Father is not in you because those are all contradictory to what, to what, um, to what God has for us, to God's truth. Now... The first thing it said there, or what, what the Bible says here, is that the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, these are all of the world. The lust of the flesh. So the lust of the flesh, things that feel good to your flesh, to your body. Now, once you're saved, you still have this flesh, you still have this body, and you, you've added to that the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives inside you. That's how you're of God, but you still have this flesh. Now, things that feel good to the flesh is the lust of the flesh. Galatians chapter 5, you don't have to turn there, there's this whole list where it says in, in verse 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. So he's going to tell us the works of the flesh. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. There's a lot of things listed here. If you love these things, if you love any of these things, the Bible says the love of the Father is not in you. These are the works of the flesh. These are the lusts of the flesh. Adultery, fornication, sleeping around before you're married, or, or, or sleeping around after you're married with people, with someone who's not your spouse. I'm not going to go through every single one of these things because there's so many. Envyings. Wanting something that's not your, you've envied for, for something that someone else has. It's covetousness. You want something else that's not yours. The Bible says that is, that is a work of the flesh. That's of the world. Drunkenness. Right? That's a real common one today. People like to go out and drink and get drunk. That's of the world. You shouldn't be loving that thing. Don't love alcohol. Don't love drinking. You love those things. The love of the Father is not in you. Reveling, such like. And you know, another thing that's not really listed here, but, but I think it totally applies, is music. Okay, there's music that is of this world. Music completely put out by this world. And I think this falls into the lust of the flesh because I know personally, in my own life, I, would, I, I love, I still do, I love listening to music. I love listening to music, but the music that I used to listen to was, it really appealed to the lust of the flesh. 
I mean, I could feel the music and it just, it felt good. I mean, it felt good the same way that like drinking alcohol, I mean, not exactly the same way, but you know, I mean, the reason why people drink alcohol is because it feels good. I mean, they like that feeling of drunkenness. Well, I like the feeling of listening to the world's music. And I think this could fall, easily fall into the lust of the flesh. Now, music is extremely powerful. And I've gone, I've had an entire sermon about this before. Music is very powerful, something you ought, to, you ought to look out for. Because if it's of the world, it's going to speak of the things of the world. And guess what? It's going to be teaching you the things of the world. It's going to teach those things. And those things get stuck in your mind. And as I said this morning, you know, a lot of times we, we could fall into habit. We could sing songs, even good songs, songs in the, in the songbook, songs that you know, songs that are good songs and you love them. You don't always think about them. You repeat them, you sing them. And I do this all the time, too. I mean, you know, it's not like it's necessarily a bad thing, but it's, it's kind of inherent in music. You memorize it, you know it, you sing it, you go along with it, you hear the words, it sounds great, you like it, but you're not always thinking about it. And, that's, and, and music is powerful for that very reason, because it gets stuck in your head. I am continually fighting the music that is burned and etched in my memory from all of the world's music that I listened to for my first 30 years of life that's just burned in my memory and it just, I mean, I, I have entire, so I have entire albums probably memorized word for word on this music and it's, and it's the world's garbage, it's the world's wisdom, it's the world's drunkenness, it's the world's fornication. Those are the things that the world talks about because those are all of the world. That's what they teach. The Bible says teaching one another in songs and hymns and spiritual songs. Teaching and admonishing one another, you know what? It's not, teaching is not only found in the songs that are spiritual, and they're songs that are good. The songs of the world also teach. You ought to get, if it's, if it's of the world, if that person, I mean, if that person is not saved, first of all, that's not coming from God. They don't have the spirit of God. That, I mean, first and foremost, that is, that is just like the bare minimum. If someone's saying they're not even saved, why are you going to be listening and getting that influence in your head? Don't listen to it because it's going gonna, it's gonna to affect you. Those words are going to sink down into your mind and it will have an impact on you. You might think that, oh, I'm strong. I can listen to this. I just like, this, the, I just like the music. Don't fall into that trap. That is exactly the trap. That is Satan's trap. He, he traps you. He uses that tune. He uses that melody to tickle your heart, to tickle your soul, to think, oh, man, I really like this. And he uses that as a vehicle to cram garbage down into your brain and to get you to remember those things and to, to pollute and corrupt your mind. Do not love the music of this world. Do not love anything of this world. Second thing, the lust of the eyes. Now, these are things you might not even actually <clears throat> act on or do, but they're still of the world. Things that you like to look at. Things of this world you like to look at. Uh, for men, the, the, the easy one is, that, you know, women. Looking at women. Looking at scandalous type women. I mean, in Arizona, especially in the valley, they're all over the place. In the summertime, I mean, people strip down and wear almost nothing and, and expose their nakedness. And it's a temptation for men, but don't fall into the lust of the eyes. That's of the world. When you give in to that lust that's on your eyes and allow your eyes to feast on, on, on something that you ought not to be looking at, that is of the world. Don't love those things. Don't love to look on sin. Don't love to look on things that you shouldn't be looking at. The Bible says on alcohol, don't even look at it. Proverbs 23 says, in, you know, um, when the wine, when it's red, when it moveth, when it stirreth itself aright, um, you know, it says not, oh man, I'm, I'm totally butchering that verse. I have it memorized and it's failing me right now. It says, don't even look at it. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red. That's what it says. And covetousness is another thing that's a lust of the eyes. You see something that someone else... And this is probably the most common thing. This is something that affects probably, especially in today's society, where you have it's just a commercialized society, and people are all trying to sell you stuff and tell you, you need this, you need this, you need to keep up with the neighbors. You know, People don't even realize this is a sin anymore. Covetousness, wanting something that you don't have, and especially those things that you can't have. Wanting something that someone else owns. I shouldn't be looking at my neighbor's RV and going, man, I really would like that RV. That's covetousness. That's wickedness. 
That's a lust of the eyes. I ought, that's a lust of the flesh as well. And it doesn't matter what is anything. Anything that you're looking at that doesn't belong to you and you really want that and then put it belongs to somebody else. That's covetousness. That's of the world. Don't love those things. And then the pride of life, you know, having a proud attitude instead of a humble and a meek spirit, just being real proud and um, you know, not being able to ac accept correction or instruction. You know, the pride of life, putting all this pride into, into, into your works and the things that you do and the things that you accomplish instead of giving the honor and glory unto God. Hey, that's of the world. The world's going to tell you, you know, pat you on the back, yeah, you did a good job. You know, you, you deserve all this stuff, you know, because you're so great and you worked so hard. When really, you know, every good gift is, is from above. Every good gift that, you know, is from God. And we ought to give God the, the, the credit and the honor and the glory for the abilities that he's given you, for the skills that you have, for all these things that even allowed you to do this stuff. You shouldn't have a proud attitude. And all of these attributes, these attributes of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, that are of the world, these can pretty much be assigned to the most popular people in this world. You think about the people who are constantly in the news, and, and for any reason, I'm not even just talking about the entertainment, all the entertainment issue, I'm going to get on that in just a second. I mean, you think about world leaders, you think about anybody who's popular today for whatever reason, music, movies, politicians, I mean, you name it, people who are just loved by the world, you know that like a lot of these things, yeah, they fit that category. They have these things because they're of the world. The world loves them. The world promotes them. And they're full of this stuff that is not of God, but is of the world. They're full of the lust of the flesh. They're full of the lust of the eyes. And they're full of the pride of life. Because they're of the world. Now, if it's not right for them to be doing these things, if it's not right for them to be living that way, do you think it's right for you to be listening to them and looking up to them? And, and even being entertained by them. You know, the majority of the entertainment industry already is overrun by sodomites. It's overrun by these queers that just hate God. They want nothing to do with God. They have nothing to do with, with what's righteousness. They're, they love living in filth. They promote their filthy lifestyle. Yet you're going to go, oh, Christian, that claims to love God. You're going to turn on their music and jam out to, to Elton John or Queen or some other filthy pervert that hates God, you're going to just enjoy that and listen to it and love it and say, oh yeah, I love God. Sorry, God, by the way, I'm just going to, I'm going to listen to this homo. I'm going to listen to this predator. I'm going to listen to this hater of God. And I'm going to enjoy what they're putting out for me. Even though they hate you, God, I'm, I, you know, it's not a big deal. Or I'm, I'm going to put a poster of this, you know, this movie star on my wall. I don't care that they hate you and they're against you and they're of this world and they're promoting everything that the devil has. I'm, I'm still, you know, I still want to watch that movie. I don't, you know, I know, you know, they, in the movie, they, they go and, they, you know, there's fornication and adultery, but, you know, it's, it's just a movie. It's just fake. No, don't put that filth in front of your eyes. That's of the world. If you love those things, Get right with God. If you have a love for that, for, for the sinful, for the people who are lifted up the most, if you read People magazine and you care so much about the entertainment industry and these sodomites and these people who are loved by the world and these people who are lifted up, you need to get right with God because those are not the things that you ought to be loving. Those are not the things that you ought to be spending your time caring about. The things of this world, you ought to be spending your time Doing, you're laying up for yourself treasures in heaven. Things that are of God. And giving those the most importance. Some things the world's going to tell you. Because the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. But see, as you watch these movies, as you listen to this music, as you get more involved with the world, they're gonna, they're, they have an agenda. It's an anti-Christ agenda. They're trying to get you away from God. And that's why these things are so popular today and the people are so strongly influenced by the world. What I'm going to say right now, it's not going to surprise you one bit because you hear it all the time. The world's going to tell you, hey, don't have too many children. 
Too many. Be smart about it. Well, you know, you only need one or two, you know. Hey, the world's getting pretty populated, you know. We don't want to get overpopulated. You, know, you want to watch your carbon footprint. You know, you hey, you know, if you have too many kids, how are you going to afford that? How are you going to put them through college? How are they going to have a good and decent life if there's just so many of these kids? You know, they're not going to have all the nice vacations. They're not going to have the designer clothing. They're not going to have all this stuff because you're not going to be able to afford it. You shouldn't have that many kids. That's the wisdom of this world. It's foolishness. They're also going to tell you not to spank your children. They're going to tell you, oh, no, 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 no. I, you know, the Bible. Why, why are you reading that book? Why do you, why do you, why do you even listen to that? That's so old and antiquated. You got to get with the times. You got to get with, you know, people nowadays. They use timeouts. They use more humane methods. That's just barbaric to spank your children. This is what the world's going to tell you. They're going to tell you, you know what? I know the Bible says to, to you know, for the men to, to provide for their own and for, for them of their own household. But the world's going to tell you, send your wife to work. Send the woman to work. Send them to go and to do this stuff. The world's going to tell you, it's okay for men to have long hair and for women to have short hair. You know, that's not a big deal. I don't care that the Bible says it's a shame for a man to have long hair. And that the woman's hair is given to her for, for a covering. And it's a glory for women. You know, that's okay. But the world's going to tell you, hey, it's okay for women to put on a pair of pants and, and just to dress like a man. The world's going to tell you, that, you know what? You know who even invented that? That women putting on a pair of pants? That came from a sodomite. The, there's a man, he just died a couple years ago. And I looked him up and... You know, people were just all upset. Oh, yeah, this guy died. But he did so much for the fashion industry. And his claim to fame was that he's the one that put women in pants. He's the one. It came from a sodomite. A sodomite clothing designer is the one that is attributed with putting women in pants. Amen. Yeah, that's, that's what we want. We want the world telling us. We want all this wisdom from the world. The world's going to tell you, hey, it's okay to go around when you're young and sow your wild oats, you know, get it out of your system before you get married. Yeah, I, I know what the Bible says about fornication, but you know, again, that Bible is old. The world's going to tell you, hey, it's okay for two people who are in love to have a relationship together, even if they're the same gender. That's not filthy, you know, even though the Bible calls it filthy and wicked and abomination and strange flesh. No, 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 it's okay. The world's also going to tell you, hey, all religions are good. Be, you know, believe what you want, but just don't judge. Don't, don't judge other religions. You, you have a religion, it's fine, it's good. You know, but you know, we're, we're all, all the religions are good. Everybody's good, it's all okay. You, know. you can have your religion, you can love God and, and, and love everyone else and, and don't judge anyone, and that's just fine with the world. But you know what the world hates? The world hates the Holy Ghost. The world hates Jesus Christ. The world hates God the Father. The Holy Ghost came to reprove this world of sin. And anyone that's preaching through the Holy Ghost is going to reprove the world of sin. We're not going to stand for that. This church, this church, Word of Truth Baptist Church, is not going to stand for any of that stuff. We are going to reprove the world of sin. Now, turn to James chapter 4, because this is the last thing. I want this to sink in. These are strong words. God gives us really strong words concerning loving the world and loving the things that are, that are of the world and that are in the world. He gives us some very strong words. And we ought not to let this pass us over. Look at James chapter 4 and verse 7. And we already saw in 1 John 5, we already saw where the Bible says that um, what does it say? It says that, or in um, First John, or, yeah, First John chapter two it says, uh, you know, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's pretty strong. <laughs> if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. Look at James chapter four. Look at verse number four. The Bible says, "Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God?" Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. 
just being friends with the world. Just say, you know what? You know, I'm not, I'm not like the world, but I want to be, I want to be friends with the world. I want to be buddy buddy with the world. I says, you're the enemy of God. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be called the enemy of God. I want to be ambassador for Christ. I want to be a man of God. I want to be of the Father. I want to be of the Son. I want to be of the Holy Ghost and preach the truth. And I love God. I don't want to be called the enemy of God. So in order to make sure that I'm not the enemy of God, I am not going to be a friend of this world. I am not friends with this world. I am not going to let the, the, the filthiness and the covetousness and the things of this world cleave to me. And you know how I'm going to do that? I'm not going to put it in front of my eyes. I'm going to keep my eyes pure. I'm not going to watch the TV. I'm not going to watch the movies. I'm not going to listen to the music. I'm going to try my best to avoid all of the, the, the promotion of this filth that the world is trying to pump out. I'm not going to be a part of it. I don't want anything to do with it. I'm going to reprove it, but I'm not going to be joined and yoked up with the world. Now look, I know we're not all perfect. But the whole point, the whole point of coming here and the whole point of reading God's word is look, if something applies to you, change. God wants you to, to, to grow. God wants you to, to become a better Christian. I'm not perfect. Look, there's a lot of things in this world. The, world, the devil has a lot of influence. The devil has a lot of power. And he's going to try to creep in and he's going to try to deceive you. And he's going to do his best. He's going to discourage you. He's going to cast doubt in God's word. But be of good cheer. Jesus has overcome the world. Jesus has overcome the devil. Have faith. Keep that faith. Keep your eyes in, in the Bible. Keep your heart meditating on God's word. When something strikes you, don't bristle. Don't, don't, don't have a bad attitude about it. I pray just, just first judge. Judge the spirit. Judge whether it's of God. You hear something, maybe it doesn't sound right. I don't know. Maybe you've never heard it before. Maybe something's like, oh, I don't know. Is that really right? Judge for yourself, but judge it according to God's word. Judge whether the spirit is of God or not. And if you do that, if, if it's according to God's word, you can't go wrong. You can't go wrong. But I would just urge caution for, for everybody. And that, that I'd like to err, like, if I'm not sure about something, if I'm not sure if something's a sin or if something's of the world or if something's, you know, maybe not right, I would much rather err on the side of caution and just say, you know what, I, I'm just not going to do it. If I don't know, if I don't really know, if I'm not, if I'm not very, you know, just firmed up on it and, and I, I can't really say for sure according to the Bible, I'm just, just why mess with it? Why mess with it? Because most likely, whatever it is, is probably not some major thing in your life anyways. I mean, it's probably, in the grand scheme of things, it's probably not that big of a deal whether you do it or not or whatever, you know, whatever the situation is. Um, and that's the way I like to live my life, and I, and I think it's probably, it's a safe way. I mean, I don't even want to be, I don't even want to be close to being looked at as the enemy of God. I don't want to be not just not a friend. I want to be like an enemy of the world. I don't, I don't want to be so close where it's like, is he a friend of the world? I don't know. I can't quite tell. I want to be like, you're the enemy. And I'm going to reprove and rebuke the things of the world. So hopefully, uh, hopefully you learned something tonight. You know, we went through a lot of scripture. Like I said, try, try what, was, what was preached tonight. Compare it with the scripture. See if it lines up. And, um, and hopefully everyone here, we could, we could all just, just grow more in truth and, and, and just become less worldly and less sinful and, and serve God better. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.